and Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against. With her hand on the Bible and Stanley Proudy, proudly on the steps of our nation's capital, Vice President Kamala Harris shattered barriers yesterday, becoming our country's second in command. The former California senator is the first of many titles. She's the first woman, the first person of color, and the first daughter of immigrants to hold the nationally elected office. The proud Howard University alumna is also the first member of the oldest African-American sorority in the nation, Alpha Kappa Alpha, to reach such heights. And there is no doubt her AKA sisters were cheering her on. In a deliberate nod to the organization yesterday, Harris wore a strand <laughs> of pearls. That is the sorority's symbol of unity and sisterhood, and it stands for the 20 founders of the sorority. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Glenda Glover. She is the international president and the CEO of Alpha Kappa Alpha. She's also the president of Tennessee State University. Dr. Glover, it's good to see you again. Uh, I knew we'd be talking to you about this, and I knew you'd have a big smile on your face because <laughs> this was the moment um, that no doubt changed both the face and the fabric of American democracy. Just describe for us how it felt to watch Vice President Harris, Madam Vice President, and her historic swearing in. Oh, it was such a special moment, a moment of pride, a moment of thanks, a moment of celebration. It was just a special day for, for black women, a special day for women, a special day for America. It's just for our whole democracy. It was just wonderful. You know, as I was sort of watching her up there, it occurred to me that people enter politics for all sorts of reasons. We call it public service, but not everyone is focused on public service when they decide to be a politician. But the thing about Alpha Kappa Alpha and the other uh, sororities and fraternities, the Divine Nine, is that they are surely a net networking organizations, but they're really service oriented. I mean, everyone, while they're in school and after they graduate, all the members that I've ever known are always looking for ways to give back. Um, I want to ask you about how you think that helped to shape Kamala Harris's pursuit of politics. Well, you're right. We're all service organizations. Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, all the black sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, Zeta Phi Beta Sigma Gamma Rho. We're all service organizations. And as it as it pertains to this particular election, of course, being a nonprofit, we can't say go out and vote for Kamala Harris. We can definitely say register to vote, uh, be engaged, have voter engagement, voter education. You, you must have some type of voter activity to and remain engaged because that's part of your civic uh, responsibility. It's part of your Alpha Alpha responsibility that you must be engaged. So I think that engagement, that civic engagement, that leadership qualities that we instill in young ladies, that you're here to, your first obligation is always to your educational pursuit while you're in college. But you must also have this, 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 this yearning to serve. And I think it was that yearning to serve that just propelled. I mean, she has kept going with a serving and serving others, and that's what she's been doing. There's there's something else about the Divine Nine, um, and specifically AKA uh, Dr. Glover, that I think is interesting to note for our viewers. Um, I, I recall, and Emory, you'll remember this, that when uh, the possible potential um, candidates for vice president were being considered, um, that someone had indicated that uh, Vice President Harris was, <laughs> quote, too ambitious. And I just yes. remember thinking to myself, like, no one ever said that about JFK, no one ever said that about you know uh, anybody who's run for higher office or you know JD Rockefeller or anybody who's had any kind of significant outsized influence on American life and politics um, but that is something that is instilled in the young women who are members of your sorority yes you know we have to shut that down immediately well it, it, first of all I was outraged in the black community when they said that here's a young lady who has achieved so much and that she would be too ambitious to be on the ticket because she would be preparing for president from day one. Well, her job is to be vice president. She knows how to be in a supportive role. She knows that if anything happens, that she'll be called upon to, to assist. So it was just so asinine that we just said, let me let me jump on this right now and attack this. And so I had to write this letter. <laughs> and, uh, and let them know that 
that's what we instill in, 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 in students as you grow through. You know, we have students that come from all I mean, various backgrounds. Some are not ready for college yet. Some are, are need more competitive environments. But we work through all of them. But the one thing we tell them you must be is ambitious. You know, we, we instill it. When I see an ambitious black woman, when I see an ambitious student who's graduating has that ambition as part of her her persona, I know then I've done my job. <laughs> so I was happy to hear that someone's ambitious. It's not a bad word; it's a good word, you know, to be ambitious. Doc- Dr. Glenda, I want to ask you really quickly because we're running out of time. You know, uh, she is not only a first of many when it comes to being a vice president, but she's going to be a very visible one, right? She's going to be the deciding vote in the Senate. So unlike other vice presidents, we're going to see her a lot. I'm wondering what you hope this does um, for not only black sororities and fraternities, but also HBCUs, how people feel about the graduates of these schools. Well, she's going from... Um, she's going to be a tie, potential tiebreaker, decision maker. And so and she's going to have this platform of HBCU. And I'm going to assist her with HBCU platform because HBCUs need research centers. They need to be STEM magnets. They need um, infrastructure. We need uh, funds relating to an endowment. And so, but she is showing that HBCUs have produced uh, uh, the top level executives, the top quality. So no one can ever ask that question again about are HBCUs relevant? Because she has shown that HBCUs are relevant and they can move to the second position in this country. So that question is put to bed. Mm. (laughs) Dr. Glenda Baskin Glover, lovely talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you.